In this video, we will explore the forces of evolution. In other words, the mechanisms that cause a population to change over time. Populations are the smallest unit of evolution. Remember that a population is a group of organisms of the same species in a particular area, such as this population of wild pigs. And populations, not individuals, can evolve. And all of the genes collected together from a population is known as a gene pool. This is important because to know if a population is evolving, you have to analyze its gene pool. One way to analyze a gene pool is to look at allele frequencies. Alleles are alternative forms of genes for a certain trait. So here we have the trait of coat color. Some coats are brown and some coats are gray. And the allele that is recessive contributes to a gray coat color. The dominant allele contributes to a brown coat color. So each of these is an alternative gene for the coat color trait. To calculate allele frequency, you simply count up the number of a particular allele and divide it by the total number of alleles for that trait in the gene pool. So if we wanted the recessive allele frequency, well, there's one, two, three, four, five, out of a total of two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14 alleles. So that gives me 36%. You can try calculating the dominant frequency and you would get 64%. We can also calculate genotype frequencies. Genotypes are combinations of alleles for a trait. So rather than just a dominant or a recessive, we're gonna put those together. If we combine a dominant with a recessive, that's a heterozygous genotype. If we combine two dominant alleles, we have a homozygous dominant genotype. And if we combine the two recessive alleles, we have a homozygous recessive genotype. So to calculate genotype frequency, it's a little bit different because we will count up the number of a genotype divided by the total number of genotypes. So for example, the heterozygous genotype. There's one, two, three in this population out of a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven genotypes. So that gives us 43%. You could try calculating the frequency of the recessive genotype. So if we can observe allele frequencies in a population, we can observe evolution. Because evolution at its smallest scale is a change in allele frequencies. Here's what I mean by that. In this population of butterflies, we have a frequency of a recessive allele that is one out of eight. The frequency of the dominant allele is seven out of eight. In the offspring, we see that the recessive allele frequency has changed to 25%, which means the dominant allele frequency has also changed. This is evolution in a nutshell in the smallest way possible. A change in allele frequency from one generation to the next. And sometimes you'll hear this kind of small scale change called microevolution. It's still evolution though, change in allele frequencies. So what can cause these allele frequencies to change? Well, there's four main forces, one of which natural selection we've studied in detail, but there are three other forces that oftentimes aren't discussed, even though they're very important. So let's look at these four forces. Natural selection, of course, happens when you have a selecting agent, such as this predator, uh, that makes some phenotypes more adaptive than other phenotypes. In this case, the tan phenotype is more adaptive. So we have our parental population with 50% dominant T allele. Unfortunately, some with the recessive phenotype are eaten. And so these are the parents who survive and reproduce. And in the offspring, there's a higher percentage, a higher frequency of the dominant allele. This is evolution because 50% is different from 75%. And this is the only evolutionary force that is adaptive. It makes the populations better suited to their environment. And it happens because the individuals with the adaptations have a higher fitness. 
fitness is not about just being strong or fast or surviving. Fitness is about reproductive success. So the more babies you have, the more fit you are. Mutation is another evolutionary force. Here we have two parents. Both have only the recessive allele, but then their offspring has a dominant allele. Where did that come from? Well, perhaps a mutation. Maybe an error in DNA replication changed the DNA sequence. Now, this can only lead to evolution if the mutation occurs in the egg or the sperm of the parent, because those are the only cells passed on to the offspring. This is a very weak evolutionary force because mutation rates are usually pretty low. However, mutation does provide variation. Now we have this tan phenotype, and that can be acted on by a more powerful force like selection. And this force, unlike selection, is not necessarily adaptive. This mutation could be good or bad depending on the environment. The mutation in and of itself could go either way. Similarly, gene flow is also not necessarily adaptive. Here we have an individual moving from one population into another population, and that is going to change the allele frequency. Originally, it was 100% recessive T. Now, it's 86% recessive T because this individual brought some dominant alleles into the population. So gene flow is just migration, individuals moving in or out of a population. And it could be for the good, it could be for the worse. Not necessarily adaptive, depends on who is moving and what that environment is like. The final force is genetic drift. And this is all about random changes in a population. So here we've got this population, 33% frequency of the recessive allele. Someone comes along and steps on a couple of the beetles, and that changes the frequency of the allele. Now, the beetles that got stepped on weren't necessarily less fit. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was bad luck. So this is chance events, random changes, not necessarily adaptive. And drift has a bigger effect on smaller populations. If this beetle population were thousands, then the couple that died when this person stepped on them wouldn't change the allele frequency very much. But because there are only a few beetles in the population, losing two had a dramatic effect on the population. And we're going to come back to this when we look at extinction. Again, keep in mind, this is not necessarily adaptive. The ones that die due to drift could be good or bad. One example of drift is known as the bottleneck effect. And this occurs when a catastrophe in the environment destroys most of a population. And because of that catastrophe, the individuals who survive might have a very different gene pool than the original population. The founder effect is a second type of drift. What happens here is a few individuals from a population move to a new area and start a different population. And if the individuals who move have a different gene pool than the original, that's going to change allele frequency and cause evolution. Our last note here is about something called non-random mating. It's technically not a force of evolution, but it can indirectly lead to evolution. So with non-random mating, uh, basically individuals are showing some sort of preference for certain mates. So in other words, individuals don't have an equal chance of mating with all other individuals. Now this could happen because organisms have a preference for a certain trait. Small beetles like other small beetles and big beetles like other big beetles. It can also happen with inbreeding where uh, in some populations uh, family members prefer other family members. It doesn't happen with humans too often but it can happen with other species. So this doesn't cause a level evolution because it won't change allele frequencies. It will only change genotype and phenotype frequencies. It will cause the alleles to be reshuffled in a different way, but it won't change the alleles. And that concludes our exploration of the forces of evolution.